on camera. All right. Today is Friday, December 9th, 2016, and we are here at the Atlanta History Center. Um, my name is Sue Verhoff, and I'm Director of Oral History and Genealogy at the History Center. With us today is Maureen Keeler, who is a volunteer for the Atlanta History Center. And we are honored and proud today to have with us Mr. Michael Riles. Uh, Michael Riles was uh, with the United States Army and served from 1977 to 1981 um, in some intelligence capacity. So we're really excited uh, for this interview. We want to thank you very much. You're very welcome. Thank you for your service, first of all, and thank, thank you. you for coming and taking the time to, to do this interview. Um, with Mr. Riles today is his wife Elizabeth and his son Adam. And we want to welcome you and thank you for coming today, too. Um, we're grateful for the time that you're taking to do this. This interview is being conducted in connection with the Library of Congress's Veterans History Project. Mm -hmm. uh, the interview will be archived at the Library of Congress and also here at the Atlanta History Center. Mm -hmm. So thank you very much. So we'll begin today um, by asking you when and where were you born? Okay, uh, Chicago, Illinois, uh, and it was in 1951, August 13. Okay, very good. And tell us a little bit about your growing up in Chicago. Interesting life. Um, when I was five years old, I woke up one day and suddenly the friends that I was playing with were gone and some new friends came in and they were speaking Russian, Ukrainian. Uh, Khrushchev led about 100,000 uh, Jews out of the country and I joke in some of my books I published that they moved into my building and my building alone. Great experience. I was the little Presbyterian boy in the basement apartment and I became quickly the young Perevochik, which is Russian for a translator. The parents there at that time wanted their children to assimilate. They wanted them to learn English, become Horoshi Americanites, good Americans. So I found myself in the auspicious position of being um, given money to take the children to the ball game, the Cubs, the Sox, the museums, everywhere. And uh, they paid quite well, they tipped quite well. And so here I am, I'm around maybe eight or nine years old in the latter part of the Eisenhower administration, uh, being something of a little entrepreneur. And I led more campaigns in Caesar to some of these events in Chicago. But it was a very rewarding experience, and I did pick up the language because, you know, kids' minds are like sponges. And yes, they told me to speak English, but when they were out in their element, they spoke Russian, and I picked it up. So we'd play little games like Stalingrad, where we'd play war games in the gangways and stuff. And so um, I, it just stayed with me. And uh, that was probably from age five to when I started high school. And when you got into high school, there were kids from all over Chicago. And one individual I went to high school with, you probably know him very well, is Scott Simon of NPR. Yes, he was in my division. And I met him oh, about 10 years ago when he was visiting here. Uh, I went to college in Chicago, uh, three years University of Illinois. And I finished up at Northeastern Illinois University in a degree in history. I was going to teach it in high school. Uh, many of my mentors I had were high school history teachers. You grow up with people like this who served in the Soviet Union, the Red Army during the war, and also my father, who was in Europe and the Pacific during the war. Um, you build up a penchant for history. And I just was eating it up, watching it on, on the PBS in Chicago. Uh, Walter Cronkite had the 20th century. So a lot of boomer kids just got into history big time. And so uh, I studied it, and I was going to teach, but I got out of school in 74. And the uh, uh, Yom Kippur War broke out a year before and the embargo. So nobody was going to leave teaching positions. So I got on the list and I went across the street to an employment agency and the guy asked me, well, can you sell? I said, well, I was about eight years old selling uh, uh, tours to Chicago, be it to Al Capone's. And that was the thing too about the Eastern Europeans. They, the first words were, Gide Al Capone, where's Al Capone? Where's the St. Valentine's Day Massacre site? All that. So here I am with my little flag, just like tourists, you know, getting on the L on a Sunday because you got a super transfer. And I knew where Dillinger was taken out. I knew all this stuff because, thank God for the library system, they had places that showed where this happened. So I researched it, got my thing down, got a little friend of mine named Gregory Stalinsky. He was my pedagogic. And uh, so he went with me. When people asked questions, he would interpret back and forth. And that was pretty much the growing up experience. Um, I went into the Army. Uh, I worked three years in a private company in Evanston, Illinois. And I got what my dad calls itchy feet. Uh, and I was working one day, and suddenly I had my Walkman on. You probably remember what a Walkman was. And I was listening to NPR, and they were talking about solidarity, which was the uh, independence trade movement in Poland. 
Uh, I'm on the bus and the job's not going great. I, I, I remember the day I decided maybe to talk to a recruiter was when uh, there was a car crash outside the building. And having been in the Boy Scouts, uh, I knew what happened when the man got out of the car. He was walking with a really bad gash and he was bleeding profusely. So I looked at my buddy I was working with who was also a Boy Scout said, first aid kit, I'll meet you out there. We told the uh, reception, call 911. We both just ran out, administered first aid, you know, cauterized the wound. And normally I'm a person that gets kind of funny about blood. I, I, if I see it on TV, I do this number. I can't look at it. But when somebody's life's on the line, you, you just drop that. So we got him down, treated for shock, dressed it up. Got back to the office, the boss upstairs came down, yelled at us for leaving our desk. <laughs> yeah, I know. Uh, okay, and as he got finished letting us have it, the fireman walked in and said, uh, can I ask a question, who fixed the wound up of this guy? <laughs> Me, I thought, oh, did I do a bad job? No, you did a great job. Were you in the military? Uh, no, Boy Scouts? Oh, okay, good job. So there was, you know, getting <laughs> yelled at, then getting complimented at the same day. So I'm on the bus. Here to walk, man, here about solidarity. I look up out of the bus in downtown Evanston, and there is a building, U.S. Army recruiting, and they had a sign out there because this was in 77, and you know, you had the recession coming in uh, in the late 70s. And it said, Hey guys, gals, we're hiring. <laughs> so I thought, Oh, what the heck? My dad served, my brother served, you know, I'm single. I, why not? Ding, get off, and I talked to a recruiter. Now, he asked me a question about, um, what skill sets I had because this is three years into the all-volunteer army. So they're looking for people that have specific skills that they can use. I said, well, I got a history degree. Okay, no any languages. Well, Russian, but I can't read or write it. You speak what? <laughs> it was like that. Do you like prime rib? Yes, sir, I love prime rib. Okay, so he told me to go downtown, take some battery tests, one of which was called a DLAT, Defense Language Aptitude Test. What they did was, you probably heard about this, after World War I, there was a group uh, with the um, League of Nations that felt that if everybody spoke the same language, there would be no more war. It was called Esperanto. Okay, so they used Esperanto to gauge your ability to retain um, language concepts, you know, conjugations, tenses, and what have you. So you read these things for about a minute, then they gave you a sheet, answer the question, another thing, you did that. Then they gave me a Russian listening test because I told them I'm illiterate. <laughs> um, so I listened to the question and you answer A, B, C, D, you know, Gidia Skolu, what does that mean? Huh? Where's the school? It was very easy. Passed it, aced it. Had my prime rim and then there was a man with him at the, rec with the recruiter who was from INSCOM, Intelligence and Security Command. And he just laid on the questions. How would you like to live in Europe for three years? Oh yeah. <laughs> How would you like to have 30 days paid leave? Oh yeah. Okay, how would you like to be somewhere where you can listen to Russians day and night? Oh, yeah, no problem. <laughs> so that pretty much sealed the deal. I went in in, uh, in reserve capacity, uh, resigned from the company. I found a guy in Chicago with something called a learning exchange, and he was uh, from Israel. Well, I'm sorry, from Poland. He defected to Israel, and he was a Mossad agent, and he was a uh, structural engineer in Chicago. And he had a little thing where we trade off on barter. I'd teach him how to write English just like I was doing with the kids, and he taught me how to write Cyrillic and Russian. So I went to him for about two months to try to get a basic literacy in Russian language, how to write Cyrillic and everything, so I can read it and everything. So I did that prior to going in, and I uh, went into basic training in Fort Leonard Wood. I was kind of pop, because I was 26 years old. The rest of these guys were 18, 19. So like my dad, who was drafted in his 30s, he became pop Riles, so I was pop Riles too, I guess. And, but the kids were good. Um, I had a lot of kids who were uh, Mormon faith and the most nicest, most polite people I've ever met. And uh, I was their squad leader. And so I went through normal basic. Uh, had to go through a regimen of a uh, series of questions for my security clearance. Oddest things I've ever had <laughs> in my life. But I answered them and then uh, wound up uh, in um, San Angelo, uh, Texas. And there was a base there called Goodfellow. And there they taught us what we'd have to be doing for our MOS, which is our military occupation specialty. And so I spent time there before the assignment was given to me, which was Berlin, Germany. And I thought, okay. Back then, they, they guaranteed the assignment. In other words, you went in, you got a contract. And again, it was a hard sell getting the military three years after the end of the Vietnam War. So they, just like a business. So, uh, Got my orders, went home on leave. My father was kind of like, he was over there, but he got pulled up after Bastogne to go to the Pacific. 
for the invasion of Japan, which never happened, thankfully. <laughs> My dad was a cook. And here's a story he told me that he never told me growing up, because most veterans, as you know, if they saw trauma, they didn't talk about it. My uncle was in Saipan and Iwo Jima, kept quiet, never talked about it. So my dad told me that, uh, well, I'm going to tell you a story. I woke up one morning, August 8th, 1945, in the Luzon, in the Philippines, and I saw this bright flash on the horizon. It was around 8 o'clock in the morning, just a flash. And he looked at me. I looked at him and said, my God, Dad, you saw the Hiroshima bomb. I think so. <laughs> no, I think so. You saw the Hiroshima bomb. You saw the, the little on the horizon. We're talking about a couple thousand miles north uh, to the Japanese mainland. So he, he felt like, you know, I'm proud of you doing this. I just, God, I, I hate like hell. You have to go back and do what I did. I said, well, Dad, there's peace now, and you fought and bled for it. I will be the insurance policy to keep that peace to make sure it happens. Because in Berlin, it was basically a tripwire. The British in the center sector, the French were north and we were in the south part of the Berlin. So um, I went there and um, I got to uh, Frankfurt, flew in from Frankfurt to uh, Berlin, and I was talking to a medic and I was kind of not sure exactly what the job would entail. I know there was a field station. I didn't know what that was. And he said, well, you're going to be up on a mountain that was the rubble of the Battle of Berlin. Really? Yeah. Uh, basically, he told me OS, uh, the Germans wanted to use it as a ski lift. But after the war, OSS had some different ideas. They wanted to set up a place to listen out to the east and make sure they stayed on their side and we stayed on ours. Uh, and so I was dozing off because of the jet lag, and he kind of nudged me and says, Hey, spook. And the first time somebody called me a spook, check out your welcoming committee. I looked out the starboard of the plane, and there was a Russian MiG-25 Foxpatch just coming up on the starboard. They hot dog. It's called hot dogging, right? Yeah, hot dogging, these pilots. And he, he, I could see his face. I could see him do this. <laughs> he goes, Drastvich. And I was nervous, and I thought, okay, uh, whenever something of uh, stress happens, uh, I use a little humor. So I started, hey, you can trust your car to the man who wears the star, that big red tech. <laughs> and, he, and he laughed and stuff. And the guy just kind of banked like that and pss, took off. That's the first time I said, my God, what did I get myself into? <laughs> I didn't know. Get to Berlin. Um, an NCO comes up at E6, I think, staff sergeant. Any field station here? Mm -hmm. Just with me. All right, sir, you need to take off your uh, insignia, take off your name tag. When you go through the air, kind of keep your head down, maybe do this. <laughs> now, I'm from Chicago. I thought, okay, only Al Capone does that when they show up at a court, you know, with the cameras and stuff. So I get out there, and I kind of did that, but I did this number. And off to my left was a, a kind of a short, bulgy guy with a little mustache. There was a woman next to him, and she was tall, very dark-haired. And they lifted these old cameras up and <laughs> took a picture of us. All the GIs, but specifically anybody without insignia, because they knew they were intelligence. They didn't want to get any information, a name, and all that. So I did a Bill Murray. I kind of stopped and said, hey, Boris and Natasha, how you doing? Say hi to Rocky and Bullwinkle for me, okay? They looked like Boris Bathanov and Natasha Natal. You guys remember Rocky and Bullwinkle, right? Okay, there it is, yeah. So... Got the ride into my field station, uh, to the place where we were um, quartered. Um, and I looked around at this building. I thought, okay, this isn't an army barracks. What this is, is an old, old building. Let's see if you can get it there. Okay. And it was called Lichtefelder Barracks. Under the Kaiser, when Prussia unified in the 18, late 1800s after the Franco Prussian War, Bismarck wanted to seal it and set up. Prussia, a great united Germany, because it was splintered before the unification. <clears throat> this was their West Point. And I got a picture here I took out of a little website that talks about it. Uh, I don't know if that's a Kaiser or not, but uh, there are the old Prussians there uh, assembled. And then later, when the Second War came around, there's the same building, and we all know who that is down there. <laughs> okay. It's kind of dark, and I'll see if you can see it. There we go. Okay. And my, my room was right up here in the second floor, overlooking where Adolf Hitler used to review the SS. That became their barracks. Four years later, this is uh, a building right next to it that became our rec center and snack bar. There's these guys. They won the battle, and they occupied it. And according to the Potsdam Agreement, they were to the, uh, leave the Western sector. They gave it to our officers, <coughs> and our officers uh, didn't like it because the, the rooms are very big, gigantic rooms, very cold. 
So, you know, you know what rolls downhill, they gave it to the enlisted. And that's where we stayed until about six months before I ETS, and they built a new barracks behind the thing. So that's the nature of that beast. Okay, uh, I want to drink some water. <laughs> All right, back on camera. Okay. All right, uh, when I first went to my site where I'd be working, um, I noticed uh, there were some books that were being sold called Time Life, and they did the great cities. And uh, here is a picture of where I worked. And in fact, my little cubicle was right about there at that one. It says it's a radar installation. This has all been declassified now, and it was not a radar installation. Again, NSA basically took it over from OSS, and they made it a listening center for the East. Our primary job that I had to do, and this is declassified, is uh, to pick up Russian signals, find out what the order of battle is from echelons, brigade talking to battalion, to who, whatever, and they, they give you a, just like a salesman, you get a specialty, and my specialty was a third shock army out of Magdeburg, Germany. And we would listen in, they had a whole series of people who were linguist, analyst, they would come down to me and I would recreate the radio net to see who's talking to who, when, where so we can pick up signals, speech. The Russians did not know that we were able to scramble their comms, and that was the great beauty of this. Um, uh, how they did it, I don't know. I'm sure that's still classified, but pretty good technology because you heard just garble out there, and that comes in, and it's filtered to clear voice. So the main thing we listened to, and they did the same to us, was to listen to their maneuvers in their areas called PRAs, which are permanently restricted areas. They call them reforgers and we just see if their order of battle is going to change. You know, the way they style what they do frontally and see what kind of support they have, artillery or air, what have you. And that's what we maintain. And again, my specialty was out of Magdeburg, the third shock army, the Lenin Brigade in the central Germany, which is uh, Magdeburg. When I got up there, my first night, <laughs> uh, I noticed a car. I'll see if I can put it up here, you can see it. There was a car right at the gate and I'd learned through the Potsdam Agreement that we didn't go to their permanent restricted areas where there was, uh, it was sensitive, but the Russians make their own rules as they drove up to ours just to see who's coming in. So I got off the bus and there was a young guy I met before. He was from Chicago too, um, and uh, he was an MP. And he says, uh, hey, Riles, I, I, you speak to limbo, right? <laughs> uh, yeah, okay, I need you. So I walked over there and said, you, you got to tell these pigs they're not supposed to be here. These guys, you know, they're supposed to leave. Okay, all right. Okay, they just like that. So yeah, they ain't moving, dude. Oh, God. Now he's he's an MP. He knows if something happens, he's going to have a lot of paperwork. And cops hate paperwork. I look out of the back of my shoulder here, and, and I see a British flag next to the American. I realize this site is on the, in the British sector because they had the central area. And here comes a guy that was a dead ringer for Alec Guinness. You know, Bridger River Kwai, swagger stick, everything. He was a sergeant major. Command Sergeant Major, nearest thing to God Almighty on Earth. That seems to be the problem here. It looks at my name tag, Riley's, Riles, uh, Riles, Sergeant Major. <laughs> yeah, he, they won't leave. Okay, well, here's what you're going to tell them. You're going to tell them uh, that this is Her Majesty's land, and they are to leave forthwith. Okay, I'll try that. Uh, Elizabeth II, that's her land. And they started laughing. And somebody in the back said something, and I heard a swear word to the queen, and I'm thinking, oh, God. Now, he asked me, what did he say, Riley? Uh, Sergeant Major, I really don't want to tell you what he said. Yeah, I am a command sergeant major of the Majesty's Royal Forces on the British Army of the Rhine. You will tell me immediately. Okay, no, so he said, uh, the queen. Oh, did he really? He had a sidearm. He pulled out a 9 millimeter pistol. Now... He stuck it in the car and he knocked the guy's hat off and did this number. Now, I'm from Chicago. This is a little nostalgic and terrifying. Uh, as a history major, I kind of thought, I'm going to be like the guy in Sarajevo who was there when the Archduke and Sophie were assassinated, and I'm going to win this the Third World War, <laughs> and I'm going to be on television if I never survive it. You will tell this Bolshevik bugger to get off Her Majesty's land now. So I remember this. I'll go to my grave remembering this. <laughs> I looked at the Russian, and his eyes were like this. And I said, yeah, he's Chicago. I'm from Chicago. That's a gun. Uh, please leave now. And then I said, this is my first day on the job. I don't need this S word. 
Oda, Oda. He, 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 he did the rear end, nearly <laughs> smashed into the little guard shack. The Germans, uh, Bundeswehr forces were our guards on the outside of the perimeter. The guy just backed in. It looked like he was going to knock the whole thing over, and he took off. They're going to love this. Uh, when it was over, I'm like this. My MP's going, ah, oh, thank God, no paperwork. He puts his holster back, uh, pistol back in the holster and says, you, you see, Riley's, Bridles, this is how you handle a bully. We were fighting these buggers in the Crimea with Gatling and Howitzer, while you Yanks were gallivanted about on the Great Plains chasing Indians with pop guns. Now, you know, the British have this thing about being God's gift to warfare. You saw the movie Patton, the big thing between Patton and Montgomery. Yes, Sergeant Major, that's fine. So I'm walking out to go inside, get my badge, and it got around real quick that I fought the Battle of Berlin there for about 10 minutes. <laughs> and my, 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 they call them trick chiefs. So each 24-7, uh, you call them a trick, and the trick chief is your leader there. And he says, you okay? <laughs> yeah, but I think I might be a little moist down below. He said, okay, come on. <laughs> he opened up, he had a bottle of Chevis Regal, a drink. Well, I'm sure it's a happy hour somewhere in the world because it was in, in the morning. And um, for me, one, I just calmed down everything. And he said, nah, you know these people? So it's more like the back of my you-know-what uh, warrant officer. I can't remember his name now. Um, so that was my first night on the job. And uh, it's an indelible experience on that end. I do have other stories I can tell you. If you want me to go for it, I will. <laughs> The one thing I noticed about Berlin, the first thing, that was the smell of coal. It was old looking from my vantage point. When I got to look out over the wall to see their side, it was very new, very modern. Um, my friend, when I, when I got to Berlin before I went to the site, he took me out on the town to try to keep away because of the jet lag. It was uh, early afternoon. And we're on the U-Bahn, which is our, the MARTA there. And suddenly we saw this derelict battle of booze, apple corn. Uh, it's kind of like the Boone's Farm of Germany. And he was saying, Stalingrad, Stalingrad, alles Frauen, alles Frauen. Stalingrad, nothing but women. At the Battle of Stalingrad, when some of the divisions got in, there was a, a, a wheat silo. And Russian army women got up there and held back a whole division of German soldiers. That kind of took their macho really bad. And he was bemoaning it. And he looked at us, uh, it wasn't in uniform, but we had the haircut, so he knew we were Amis. And that was the term the Germans used for us, the Amis. And he started singing the old Hos Visa Lieb, you know, pounding the foot. And he was drunk. And this woman got up at the next stop, shouted for the controller to come see here, bitte schnell, please, on the alte Nazi. Two German police came in. They told him to shut up. And he went, Heil Hitler. They <laughs> grabbed him by the feet and dragged him out, and he was just singing, holding his bottle. You saw remnants, even in the late 70s, of World War II. The, the, the whole, because I saw people that were amputated. You saw, because the average soldier in the late 70s would be in his mid to late 50s at that time, some in the 40s if they were young. So I got wind of that one real quick. All right, so we get off uh, at uh, Tiergarten, which is near Kufersendam, which is their main drag, and Dave and I walked over and we saw the Russian Memorial, which has two of the tanks that were the first two tanks on the Zhukov to go into the city. And they have a 24-7 vigil at this place. And so uh, we, we saw the change of the guard, which is every even hour. And uh, one Russian saw us, I had my little Vivitar camera out, and as he was going off, they're hams, I grew up with them, I know they're ham bones. He took his hat off and did a Dimmy Durante. He did that number <laughs> as he was going away. That was cute. We're walking toward the Reichstag, and I'm with David, and uh, suddenly there was a woman walking forward. Now, this was summer. I got there in July, and a uh, heat wave there is 82, 83 degrees. That's hot in Germany because it doesn't get that hot that high up north. And <laughs> she had nothing on from the waist up, totally. As my father from Louisiana says, naked. That was the Louisiana way of saying naked, naked. I go, my God, David, that, that girl's got nothing on. <laughs> oh, that's right, Michael. He was there about a few months before I got there because I was on security hall because I grew up with the Russians and everything. Um, I said, that's right, you're not married. Well, here, here's the thing, Mike. Um, the Germans don't consider it indecent exposure because they don't consider the body indecent. <laughs> really? 
but she's naked, David. <laughs> but this, yeah, I saw me. Yeah, hello. <laughs> My God. <laughs> so I, I know why Elvis enjoyed his tour over there now. So we're walking along. We go up to the wall. And um, we get up to the platform. And every part of the Berlin Wall has a guard shack. And they have a big camera in there. So David had something in his pocket. Um, and he said, you know what? We're going to have some fun with these guys because we listened to the East Germans as well. He pulled out uh, some stickers uh, from a lady I knew that was there uh, before me named Melanie, and she was a real Mickey Mouse nut. And these things are about the size of our unit crest. So now we didn't wear them. When you went to the wall, you had to take everything off because they're taking shots of you. So we put these Mickey Mouse stickers on our hat inside, got up there, hey, how you doing? Hey, good dog. And they put the camera out, dropped it down, took some shots. And I saw one East German in there going, Steamboat Willie, woo woo, which was the first cartoon that Dizzy put out with Steamboat. And the Germans, you say Mickey Mouse, ah, Steamboat Willie, woo woo, they do that. And you saw that on the movie, uh, Private Ryan. True. <laughs> so they took some shots. So later, when I got to know some of these German analysts and stuff, they said, hey, Ross, it worked. It was what worked. I said, well, when you guys went up there with that, they're now sitting there trying to figure out the new Roden Regiment in the, in the city. <laughs> and, no, and they're just, they're kicking this thing right back to Moscow to find out, hey, Mickey Mouse did it. So that was my first indelible fun that we had with them. And there was a cat and mouse game we played with each other. You know, this goes on to say. Um, let's see. We got to go into the east. And the tour had to be chaperoned by an E7 uh, sergeant, um, a sergeant first class or higher. And we'd go through the bus. We'd go through the little checkpoint Charlie. And I remember growing up with people that crawled these hell holes, you know, suddenly getting really like this, and I got a cold sweat. And you okay? Yeah, I just grew up with people who spent their lives crawling out of places like this. Here I am going in. Um, at that time, you were able to exchange money for East German coinage. So if you put a $5 bill down in the um, Commerce Bank in Berlin, they would exchange it to Westmarks, and then they would convert it to Eastmarks. So for $5, I can get almost 50, 60 uh, communist Eastmarks. You could have a good time on 60 East Marks in a day in East Berlin. Uh, so we went into the city and did our tour and all that. And um, the thing that I found was the people there would just look at you like you were from Mars. Uh, we were on a bus, obviously, but some of the guys could go with their own POVs. So there was these nice Western cars. They just came up to them like something from a Twilight Zone series, you know, touching and go, wow. These people were just cut off from the world. And not like North Korea, but close. So uh, on the tours that we went to, um, you'd have people come up to us begging us to sneak them out. We couldn't do that. If we did that, that'd be it. All, you know, what would break loose. And I remember one guy who was crying and saying, you are lucky, because I had a friend of mine who spoke German. He was a German analyst. And so he'd transcribe what he was saying. He said, you're lucky. You get to go anywhere you want to in the world. I can't. So I looked at Jason and said, look, do you have any American, and I feel, I thought, I got an idea. I took out a quarter, which has George Washington on it. I gave it to him, I said, and I told Jason to transcribe, tell him in German, uh, this is George Washington. There were times when he too thought it was over, that we weren't gonna win this. There were times when he got on his knees and cried. Okay, but things happened to, for the better. And that's going to happen for you and these people here. This wall is going to go down, and there's going to be a new, new world. At some point, it's going to happen. So I gave it to him, and he said, God bless George Washington. Yeah, and he just kind of wandered off. So that was a, a very indelible uh, scene in, in uh, my time and service there in Berlin. The other thing that happened was going through uh, on the train. Um, the British had a day trip, <coughs> had a nice dining car and they brought out the nice food and everything. And I remember um, stopping at uh, Potsdam, I think it was, and the Russians would move up to the train and they kind of like, uh, got anything? Mesti, uh, mesti, uh, items, I think it was. They wanted to trade off stuff. Uh, if you had a Billy Joel or a Pink Floyd record, you can hold that out and they would probably give you their mother if she was there. Uh, so I was with the Brits and this one Brit said, God, I love to get a souvenir. I said, okay, um, do you have a Playboy magazine? You know, Western Decadence. 
Yeah, I believe I got. Oh, yeah, God, do you have any girly magazines back there? Yes, I do. Give it to me, you know. <laughs> so I, I held a magazine at this Russian soldier, and he said, Wie sind die? You know what this is? Yet. Mm-hmm. Open the centerfold. <laughs> no, wie sind die? Eh? No, you know what this is, don't you? Oh, da. Oh, da. Stop it, hat What do you want? Okay, I'm like Donald Trump now. I'm going to negotiate. <laughs> We're going to get what we can. He says, okay, you think I can get a sidearm? Vasha <laughs> Ruzia? No, 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 no. He made some comment about going to a gulag if he did that. And then he said, well, how about his shoulder bullets? And the Russians have this is uh, Sovietskaya Armia. And so these are on his shoulder. And he looked around for his starzik, which is uh, Russian for old man. Moving around. Tore him off. Yeah. Gave him to me. I gave him the Playboy magazine. He's doing, ha, oh, krakrasivi. You know, how beautiful. <laughs> and he looked up, saw the gold tooth. This kid looked like, you know, he's 18 going on 12. And he said, me communist, but you capitalist, but friends, yes? <laughs> I go, wow. Now, a couple of weeks before all this, I decided to go to the PX and get a notebook and keep a diary. And I kept one. I didn't want to let these stories to go. So I started writing the stuff in. Whatever happened, happened. That's what I was doing. So that's another indelible thing that happened. Uh, let's see. Okay. In a department store in Berlin. Old woman. Now this is fast forward now. I was single when I was over there. And I went on a tour to uh, um, Vienna in uh, 79. And I was going to go in early November. But the Russians invaded Afghanistan. We were able to pick up echelon uh, signals from Afghanistan to Berlin, believe it or not. Now, it was at night when the ionosphere was charged, and those things would come up, they'd come down, and we picked up all sorts of things. So my leave got canceled, and I thought, oh, what the hey? Well, that's okay. I'll just hold you over to the bottom of the month. Okay. Um, we didn't go to war with Russia, and so uh, I got to go on leave. And I was on the same tour with my wife, who was visiting her sister and uh, her husband in Frankfurt. And, you know, you've seen those movies where Love at First Sight thing? Yeah, oh yeah, they saw her and uh, kind of hung out and talked and talked more. And I had a layover in Frankfurt when the tour was over, because I always joked with her later that I stalked her in, Berlin, in Vienna. And I popped the question three days later, and we were married a month later. Oh yeah, one of those. Yeah, now this is like an old Van Johnson movie, you know, <laughs> World War II. But I always tell my wife that whenever we see a collage, uh, there's a movie called, a show called The Americans, and they show collages of the Cold War. And uh, in that collage, you see a picture of Lenny Brezhnev doing this number. Now, he, toward the end, when I was there, was losing out. It was Alzheimer's or what, but he was sick. And we think Ustinov, who was a defense minister, was running the show there in the military. Um, that was thankful because he didn't want to go totally far because um, I'll tell you a little story after this. But... Um, I always tell my wife that it weren't for him invading Afghanistan when he did, uh, I would have gone in early November and never would have met her. Yeah, so there it is. Thank you, Lenny. <laughs> Do that. Um, let's see. Solar boards. Working at the site was fantastic. I, I met a lot of people, and I found out then that there was a dictate uh, from President Carter to all the services that if you get these liberal arts majors coming in, look, you know, they're not finding good jobs, they want to go into service, find out if their moms were war brides and they spoke either German, Russian, or Polish. So the majority of the guys I was stationed with were from up north that lived in cities like Philadelphia, Chicago, Boston, and New York where you had enclaves. And many of them had moms who were war brides. They picked it up, even among the RAF people that I knew. Because there was one little lady I was seeing before I met her that was RAF, and we were dating each other a little bit. And her, her uh, mom was a war bride as well. So she was a German linguist. And, you, know, you hear it, and you figure if you go to the school, they're going to learn it faster because they had exposure. So I got to meet a lot of guys there from all over the country that had this skill set with languages. And I remember on uh, every May Day, everything would go down. That nothing would happen. Eh. And so uh, we would still keep the signals up to listen because they had their parades and all that. And um, the, 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 the managers, the officers would go to the east and pick up um, uh, caviar and stuff. And they'd have a little party. What the heck? You know, we're listening to them. We might as well just join in the festivities. 
And uh, I liked, I heard Russian music growing up, so we clicked in somewhere and picked out the balalaika stuff, and I did the Kazetsky and all that. You know, <laughs> didn't get too sloshed. Um, <clears throat> but um, the funniest story was uh, you pick up these guys in the field because they would give the Russians some uh, uh, rations of vodka. And they would, men do, they drink. And one guy just decided to let the world know what he thought of Leonid Brezhnev, and he uh, took the microphone, placed it in the posterior of his abdomen, uh, rear end, and he let some wind out, and he said, This is what I think of Brezhnev. My language is bad now. And you heard this all through the everything. Now we're sitting there, and I hear what I thought I heard. I wonder if that's got intelligence value. Well, they're letting their guard down, so I think that's intelligence value. That means they're getting tired of communism. Maybe down the road this is going to end. That became what they call a, a, um, a, sp a Klieg light. Uh, that was the lowest form of intelligence gathering that we reported on to uh, Dern's uh, director of national security. So, yeah, I typed up the thing about that. <laughs> Another incident that occurred up at the Hill was when we picked up uh, in 79, just when I got married, um, they were building up, the Russians and Warsaw Pact were building up on the Polish border. And there's an old saying in the Army Security Agency, we're the first to know, first to go. Well, I'm going to stay. We joked about our t-shirts we had, which read in Cyrillic, we'd put these on. It said, don't shoot, we know secrets. Because if war broke out, Berlin was going to be a big POW camp. Just the, the, this end and this end, that's it, and French, British, and American. Okay. So having that foresight, I had German money to get her to New York, to San Antonio, in case something happened. And my buddy, whose wife was from Texas as well, uh, we had a plan to go and grab her and just make up some story to go to the airport without telling her <laughs> and to get on the flight. She said, we have to get out of here. Because if you told her beforehand, she'd probably stay. <laughs> so... We had that up. Now, what happened was they built up on the border. Oh, God, about 20-some divisions. They were doing the kinds of things to kind of play chicken with the West. I picked up intelligence reports that they were prepping for NBC, which is Nuclear Biological Chemical Attack. So they were playing chicken with us. We wanted to alert as well, you know, and all leaves and passes canceled. This is around Christmas, too, I believe, in 79, just when I met her, just before we got married, I think. No, after we got married. It was in uh, February of 80. Now, you know, the campaign was going on now. The Russians, and you hear this on the news lately, they do tune in to our elections. They watch the Americans closely. Whatever happens there is a trend, and they will jump at it or react to it as needed. So when they did their thing, they saw that Reagan's, Ronald Reagan's poll numbers just shot up like crazy. Love them or hate them, the Russians were terrified of Ronald Reagan. Okay. So we heard, and when we were sitting there, and I'm thinking, oh, God, I just met the woman in my dreams, and now I'm going to be in a POW camp, and I'm going to be lined up and shot because we're spies. And she's going to be home, and, and, and then I found out soon that she was with child. <laughs> yeah, so my son will never know me. Um, and then suddenly we heard, tipia, tipia, demobilizatia, tear it down, let's get out of here. They broke down, headed back to Russia. And I tell you, it was the biggest conga line and celebration you've ever seen. We were dancing around this center. The British came up. Hey, they bugged out, mates. <laughs> and we were dancing. The little girlfriend, I, yeah, I just sat there. We hugged each other and we did the da 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 boom. And uh, wow, that's another indelible thing that I'll never forget. They backed down, they left, and uh, ended there. I'll give you another little story here if I can run everything. Okay, I was there when we beat the Russians in hockey, uh, Lake Placid. Okay, yeah. Buddy of mine who was my roommate, uh, his name was Tom Holloway, and uh, his mother was uh, Belarus. And he said, Misha, we need to have some fun with this. <laughs> Put on our dress green uniforms, got a big old piece of cardboard, wrote down the final score, <laughs> went to the Russian memorial. Hey, soldati, zivnatia, smotritia. This Russian soldier looked at me and he goes, yeah, yeah. They didn't believe it. They didn't tell him that until we won the game. So that was our, nee, 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 nee. So we just went back home, had a beer, <laughs> gave it up there. <laughs> All righty. Other stories. Um, they posted me 
with the British and they got to when I was at the site of the guys that came in we got rank real quick E4 again the army had to be like a business you know okay we got to attract them we got to pay them better get them rank and all that guys who didn't have that benefit they were drafted there was a little bit of a resentment there was a little myth that we got this you know, college graduates you know, that kind of thing so there was this one uh, sergeant that just had a case of the you know what turned me and says Riles I'm sending you to the Brits again Okay, I'll go to the Brits. I went down there. Got to like them. Uh, their, their humor was dry, but I got to like them. I met this little girl, and I kind of made up that I hated going there, when in fact I loved it before I met my wife. So they became my lads, and they, once I got done, I <laughs> got doing this number. I kind of did this once walking back, and I saw an officer, and I slid in. Don't you ever salute me like that again? You heard me. <laughs> well, you keep putting me with the Brits. I mean, hey, you know, what am I going to do? <laughs> Lieutenant? <laughs> so there was that one there. Um, they were funny. Uh, whenever the Queen's birthday came around, I remember uh, going to the break area, and these guys would cluster in the corner there. And was, and they were talking. Oh, Yank. Yeah. I was the only one. Would you care to join us? Uh, it's Queen's birthday. No hard feelings. <laughs> so he held up a bottle, and I said, My, is that Chevis Regal? It did it is, sir. I grabbed a cup, and God save our gracious Queen. Long live our... Trank sat there and told stories, told them I'm from Chicago, and the first thing they say when you tell them I'm from Chicago, did you ever see any Italian gangsters? Uh, kind of, sort of, yeah. I've <laughs> seen them around the city and stuff. So that was that story there. Uh, let me see if I got anything else I can tell you about this. Uh, turns to be a buddy with me in the hockey. Heart, night, Reagan. Oh, uh, okay, uh, when Reagan was uh, shot. Uh, I was on it uh, with my wife. Uh, we went to the British duty train, we went to this little city called Braunschweig, and we'd head back. And again, the, the great feature was a nice meal, something like the Orient Express. Um, I got back, uh, it was about 7.30 at night, and then I got a call from my commanding officer, suit up, POTUS is down. Oh, God, you know, I was sure. I had about four months left of my enlistment, so I'm thinking, hey, I'm going to be here a long time. Because uh, unfortunately, well, fortunately, whenever something like that happens, they assume the worst and work down. And you know about what happened when Reagan was shot. I thought, oh, the Russians did it. Okay, no. So we're up at the site. I get up there, and there are civilians all over the place, people I never saw before. I figure probably CIA. And they're tasking us to pick a grid and listen for the words, silo, open the silo, <laughs> you know, and the codes and everything. So scary. So once again, I'm like, okay, nothing. Then I picked up a skip <coughs> from the British uh, BBC. It seems like the assailant, uh, President Reagan, his name was, um, um, oh God, what was his name? Um, the guy that shot Reagan? Hinkley. Hinkley, Hinkley, thank you. Uh, is John Hinkley. And he said he did this uh, to impress the American actress, Jodie Foster. <laughs> I didn't know Jodie Foster. And I, I took on my headphones. I said, you know, a buddy of mine from San Antonio, BC. I said, who's Jodie Foster? You know who Jodie Foster is? No. Okay, did you ever see Taxi Driver? Yeah, yeah, okay, the little teenage hooker. Oh, yeah, yeah, you talking to me, you talking to me. And we're doing this, you talking to me thing, you know, De Niro did. And I looked at the side of my own, there's a three star general standing right behind me. Ted Hot Flies, boom. Hey, as you were. What'd you hear, uh, Sergeant? Okay, uh, BBC, sir, reported that the assailant was a guy named John Hinckley, and he said he did it to impress Jerry Foster. And the general said, going, ever since we ended the draft, these kids are nuts. They <laughs> need to be in the Army to get the discipline. They so that was that story <laughs> and that one. <laughs> okay, the British, uh, another story. Um, we, um, were, uh, we had ref uh, the, uh, sharing uh, personnel. We would go and be with the Brits in the field, and they had little intelligence gathering vehicles called Tilkies. And I was assigned to one after I went to the NCO Academy in Bad Tolls, Germany, because I made sergeant. So you have to go to a two-week course on leadership and all that. So they stuck me with the Brits since I was already there. <coughs> and um, we were doing a joint reforger with the Americans, British Americans. And this uh, British officer uh, said, hey, you want to get inside of a tank? Have you ever been inside a tank, Yank? <laughs> no, I, I'm thinking of Bogart, Sahara. Wow, I'd love to get inside of a so I got inside of a chieftain. This is kind of neat. Can I turn the turn? Sure. Oh, boy. I feel like bogey in Sahara. And the two Brits behind me said, Ah, yes. You Yanks do make some smashing cinema. And they did the old badges. We don't need those thinking badges. 
our cinema is all over the world. They love it. Okay. So suddenly they turn on the radio and we picked up the Russians zooming in on our guys doing war games. Now there were a lot of African American troops in the field there in, in the tank units, Second Armored Division and stuff. <coughs> and you've, you've heard of Ebonics? Okay. They were speaking Ebonics to each other. Then I turned them all around and it's blood, all the, all the words. And I picked up this Russian uh, case officer with a, a translator who did what I did on my side. And they had a dictionary out of American slang. And I heard this Russian saying, what is the meaning of blood, uh, mofo, uh, jive turkey? Jive Turkey, Stushnat, I didn't know you. And then they're looking the stuff up. Now, I'm in a tank with a British major. He says, you know what? This is interesting. If we ever have a war with these Ivans, you know, that's what the Brits call them, the Ivans, we can do what you Yanks did in the Pacific with the Navajo language. Basically, we could speak jive, and they'll never understand what the bloody hell they're saying. We could win this one. <laughs> I go, okay. So that was that story. Now, you know why I kept a diary. <laughs> uh, another story about the Brits. Um, I heard about this, and they told me this uh, when I was there. There was a Brit tank unit that did a reforger, and they went into a little town parked off in the side, and they walked to a German uh, pub. Well, the guy that owned the pub uh, was a little older, and he was a little bit unhappy with the outcome of the Second World War. He wouldn't serve him. I say, I say we are rather thirsty. Would you please come and serve us? Mm, kind angly. Nine angly. Oh, really? Okay, that's fine. No problem. I am a soldier of the 80s. I studied Est. I know how to keep my composure. They walked out and went back to their tank, drove the tank around, stopped it. There was a big window there. And they smashed the turret right through the glass. Now you see all these Germans running out. Okay. <laughs> Again, looks like Alec Guinness. He pops the lid and he looks out. I say, dear boy, this is a rather nasty way to do business. I'm sure you're of similar sentiment. No, angry. Oh, well, okay, fine. Opposite little bugger. Like Napoleon at Waterloo. Just call me Wellington. Oh, Roger, sir, does Her Majesty have a shell sitting around back down there? I believe so, sir. Any powder kegs? Oh, yes, we do have some, sir. <laughs> pling, pling, pling. So they're loading the turret. I'm listening to this thinking, are these guys making this up? No. This is the kind of story you don't make up. <laughs> Pops it again. This is going to be a rather ugly scene. Uh, I believe it'll be a closed casket funeral. <laughs> now, the German doesn't know what he's saying. But he starts counting in German. <laughs> Ein, zwei, bitte warten Sie. Stop. Comes in. The British sit down. <laughs> the guy's like this with his little menu. And, I, and he looks at him and says, By the way, dear boy, would you happen to have Guinness? <laughs> so I thought, okay, and I'm writing this down in my little diary. That's going to be a book someday. I'll show it to you at the end. Uh, little story about the Germans, too. Um, I was in a store, and with my wife, we were married now, and they had a jacket over there called the um, NATO parka. It had the, the West German flag on it and everything. So I had one. Old woman comes up to me, looks at that flag, and she thought I was German. Because <laughs> hey, we got the hair, another little perk, the, the intelligence guys, you can grow your hair a little longer if you want. Okay. So she took her hand and whacked that flag. And she shouted, Das ist kein Deutschland. This is not Germany. Das ist ein Resultat unserer kleiner Gruppe Juden. This is a result of a small group of Jews. Und der Leitung Franklin Roosevelt und ein großer Juden. Under the leadership of Franklin Roosevelt, the big Jew. And I'm sitting there going, oh boy, another thing I put in my diary. My wife's getting ready to let <laughs> her Texas, right? Bam! Right in the old puss. And I said, honey, let her talk. Now, when she heard me say that, oh, Americana, and she got scared and just beat feet out of there. Everybody in the story, it was the first times, I think, they were just staring at us. Hey. So I pulled out my little notebook, put that one in there. The other story was uh, a lot of the youth there didn't like us being an occupier still. The war was over 30 years. Every society has its left, right, and center field politically. Well, they had a leftist there. And these kids came up to um, this one warrant officer, and this is a story I heard, I wasn't there. And they started talking about you, America should get out of here, blah, 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 blah. And he says, you know what? And, he, and the guy spoke German. I didn't want to be here. And in fact, SALT II was being negotiated with President Carter. And I don't know if you knew this or not, but we're thinking about giving this sector back to the Russians as a part of SALT II. 
Oh, it's too many lines for this. I just and they started crying, apologizing, and everything. Bringing up giving you to the Russians <laughs> didn't because they knew, yeah, this is what you're going to read, this is what you're going to wear, this is what you're going to think. Boom, they didn't want that because the one thing I noticed about Berliners at the time, they lived with a kind of a benign, reckless abandon, meaning they were joyful. They woke up every day and they were in a free, free zone. There were no tanks going down there telling people, you know, get off the street at eight, you know, go to this lecture and all that. So that's another story that um, I relate to people that I kept in my diary. Uh, okay, another story about the Brits. Um, and I was told this when I was on this reforger. Um, there were numerous attempts to uh, escape the East. They didn't just do it in Berlin. Someone would get out into the countryside. Uh, Disney made a movie about one where they built a balloon to float over. Okay, well, this one girl, I was told, uh, built a wooden ladder to put on to the wire so it was wood, the electricity wouldn't go through. And she was going up, but there's a sensor. And that would, whatever guard tower was nearby, they'd run down, get in their Jeep, and drive over there. And the, the British MP told me that she was just right at the cusp of getting over, and we were shouting, don't do it, love, don't do it, go back. And too late, they just, right off the wire, just shot her pieces. So I said, you know what we did, Yank? We decided that was a rather nasty thing to do. <laughs> so the next day, they brought out a mortar, you know, a mortar of that little cannon with a mortar base. But they didn't bring a shell. They brought a big uh, firecracker and a wrapped Coke bottle in black tape with little cardboard fins on it. They assimilated setting up a motor right at the tower. They assimilated doing the spotting. They assimilated, you know, looking at them and everything, calling out coordinates. All right, four seats, all right, all set. Okay, prepare to fire, prepare to fire. And when they said fire, they said, prepare to fire, which is fire in German. Now, uh, the, the, he told me that these Germans were like doing this number. <laughs> Come, schnell, 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 schnell. You know, the British are going to attack us. And as soon as they said foya, the guy turned around, lit the firecracker, dropped it nearby. And the two guards that killed this girl, they jumped out of the car. Boom, down they went. Now, I'm sure both their legs were broken. <coughs> so they said, we were doing a little conga line. Yeah, nah, 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 nah. We got back at the bloody bastards. And they stopped and said, Oh, my God. Here comes a T-34 Russian tank over the horizon. Whoa! <laughs> they threw the thing in the truck, and they just beat feet out of there. And the conjecture was that the Russian drove up, looking around for an explosion, seeing these two these German guards laying on the ground in excruciating pain. You know, <laughs> where was the explosion? <laughs> this is, get us to a hospital, you Russian dog. So um, that was another story that just got in there. Okay, hold tight. Let's see if I got any more here I can give you then. This is it. Uh, oh, Hitler slime. Oh, okay, here's another story. Um, going back to Berlin, I resolved to not be a barracks rat. And a barracks rat was the guy just stay in the barracks, stay in the American, just get out, see the city, travel as much as you can. This is a one shot opportunity. And I was on a bus, and there was a guy on the bus, and he was in his mid, late 50s, and he was in tears, shouting, Hitler schwein, Hitler schwein. I go, okay, I'm going to see what this is. He got off near a cemetery in Steglitz, which was the uh, center area um, in the downtown area. I followed him, and he went into the um, cemetery. And he went up to a mausoleum where there were urns, a whole bunch of them. He placed his hand on an urn, and he talked about my, my grandkinder, my grandkinder, uh, I should shun my, grand, my beautiful grandchildren. Something to the effect of, uh, had you had lived, I would have had a beautiful family. So he left, wiping it, and I went up to the urn. It was a sea leute, which was a sailor, Russian uh, or German uh, sailor, and he went down into Bismarck. The British recovered the body and prepared it for burial. And after the war, they cremated him, and they'd send the urns back with their identification if they had because everybody had dog tags on. So that was another thing that just... You, you, you know, you f we take freedom for granted, and boy, whew, wow, you live in something like this, you, you get a healthy desire to have all thought, regardless whether you're Trump, anti, I don't care, just let people speak and then go at it that way. So that was another story on mine. Okay, uh, I think I got them all here. Uh, Russian the Playboy, Brit section, beat them hockey, caviar. I understand the Brits, East German woman, barkeep, and Brits and the Scotch. That's pretty much my stories um, that I have uh, that I wanted to impart here. So, uh, yeah. 
back on camera. Okay. Uh, the other thing I did when I was in Berlin, uh, GIs are always into souvenirs, and we want to look for them all, all at all cost. I had a friend uh, who uh, had a um, metal detector, and he decided to go out and have some fun one day. He went out some areas, and he was a historian too. And he found in some field uh, an area that was reading big time for metal, and he started digging, and it wasn't that deep. He uncovered a bunker, un dug out the, 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 the uh, opening, and it was an SS bunker. And inside there were plates, cups with all the Nazis, everything. Now, he was a good guy. He, uh, he, he went to the authorities and said, I found something. He went into the near town. I don't know where it was, but it was in the western part of, of um, Berlin. Uh, souvenirs are big. I collected patches. Let me see if I can put that up there. Okay, uh, little things that we do. Uh, this was a button that we got smuggled in from the east. It's solidarity with solidarity, um, English to Russian. And uh, there are some of the patches you can get over there. And this was a batch that uh, they gave everybody as an occupation patch. There we go. Yeah, so got to keep that. Another thing I started collecting over there, uh, I like hats. In Chicago, you always wear hats, that's so cold. So there was a store that we went to when we took the British duty train, and they sold hats. This is the, the West German uh, Bundesluft, I think it was called. And you see, you already saw the Brits. Okay, that's the British. Okay, here's the army, the Bundeswehr, and I was definitely going to go see Paris someday because my dad got to liberate it, and my father said I would have enjoyed Paris more, but the Germans kept shooting at me. So I went to the. Uh, there's a really beautiful um, uh, flea market, and I got my French beret. So that's some of the things that we did over there with that. Um, keeping the diary. I resolved way later in life to write. It was going to be called I Joined the People, and the publisher said, nah, change it to something else. So I did do one up. It's out of print now, and I'm looking for a publisher to maybe find it, but that is the diary, and it became that. And recently, there is a publisher in Texas called uh, Sarah Publishing in Harlingen, and the uh, CEO of the place is an ex-Marine. He was a uh, FBI mob informant, went undercover. Oh, yeah, <laughs> brave guy. Roger. Um, and I did this. I said, it's based on my story here, but I made it into a novel. Uh, do you guys remember The Winds of War with, uh, okay, the series by Herman Volk? Okay. I've written The Winds of War. This is part one of it. And the second part is going to be, hopefully this doesn't happen in real life, but it's going to be um, the world going to war because of the Middle East. It, it's just a conjecture to history where Iran just goes to the area and there's another D-Day with the West coming in through Israel to liberate it because the Israelis hold Tel Aviv and they come in. So that's going to be called The War the World Saw Coming. That's coming out in January. I like to write. And people say, why do you like to write? Well, I grew up with Russian Jews. These people were glued to books. They read copiously. More so coming to the West because you could read what you want to. So I picked up that habit. And they say when you read a lot, you pick up a penchant for writing. So I started writing uh, very young. So I was the guy in high school, college that didn't get it with math and science. But by God, you tutor me on chemistry, I'll tutor you on English. And we got along great with friends like that. So that's the two things I did there. Okay? Okay. Do you off. want to take a break? Okay. I'll take a break and let's see. I'm trying to think. If you want to ask me questions too, I can do it. But I think I went through my outline that shall I, I sent keep you. It, shall I keep it running while we... Uh, well, turn we'll turn it off now. Okay. Yeah. All right. I'll camera. All right. Okay, I did extend for a year um, from uh, 1980 to 81 at the convenience of the service. Uh, the war in Afghanistan was going on. They needed was to pick up stuff. Uh, huh, two stories I can tell you there was um, we picked up a Russian tank reforger trying to use a snorkel to go at the base of a river to give them air because there was no bridge. And this was kind of experimental in the Red Army. But we were able to pick up a signal where a tank went into the base, kind of turned sideways, and that snorkel went. And me and others picked up a Russian soldier his final words were, God help me, and he was drowning. We picked up a drowning. Yep. Uh, the other thing that happened at the site was, um, I don't know if you guys saw the movie uh, Charlie Wilson's War, the one about uh, Tom Hanks, and he was a congressman, they were helping the Mujahideen fight the Russians. And there were scenes there that showed when we gave the Muj uh, Stinger uh, missiles, blowing up their helicopters that were just strafing and killing Afghani civilians. 
And I was up at the site, the, uh, the uh, American Air Force was near our section. And there was one guy that I knew, he used to call me Ground Pounder, which was a kind of a, a thing for GIs. I call him a Zoomy. That was a thing for the Air Force. Hey, Ground Pounder, come here, you got to hear this. So I put the headphones on. And I'm hearing uh, this guy in a helicopter, you can hear the noise, talking about, oh, my girlfriend wants me to marry her. I don't want to get married. Oh, I don't want commitment. Oh, no, 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 no. Typical guy, you know, banter. And suddenly the whole thing went like that. I took my head, I looked at him, says, what the hell was that? I think the thing blew up. So we got our warrant officer over here. Mr. Winton, we'd love to do it again. Oh, boy, well, somebody's doing their job. And I said, guys, you didn't hear this. Now, it's declassified now because the movie came out. We picked up that helicopter being blown up uh, by the Mujahideen. There's a scene in the movie where these two guys fire this thing and sh boom. And the other helicopter turned around and they just beat feet out. Again, that's how you handle a bully. <laughs> that was that situation. Um, toward the end of my enlistment, uh, my colonel, he was a great guy. Um, he looked at my record and says, Raj, you got a stellar record here. You were a salesman before you went in the Army, right? Yes, sir. I, I sold metallurgical equipment. It was an inside sales thing. Okay, well, I'm going to be a salesman right now. He's, he leans back. How would you like to be a staff sergeant? How would you like to have $20,000 tax-free? And how would you like to go to Masao, Japan for six years? <laughs> you like the food, don't you? Oh, yes, Colonel, I really like the food. Just, well, I like some of it, but that, that stuff they call sushi? I'm from Alabama. We call that bait where I'm from. Okay. <laughs> so... I said, Colonel, let me go talk to the War Department. That was the nomenclature for your wife, and I'll, I'll, I'll get back with you. I had seen a lot of guys who stay in the service. The divorce rate was horrible because you're gone. You're called up. You're out of there. It takes a formidable type of woman to tolerate that. And the kids, no father around. There was delinquency and all that. And I was a civilian before I went in. I'm going to be a happy, hairy, hairy civilian when I got out. So I let my enlistment run out, and I went home to her hometown in San Antonio. Uh, it was growing like a weed there. I was a little skittish about Chicago, you know, because um, she had family there. I just had my dad. So I went there and I put out resumes and stuff and I uh, got picked up by uh, a TV station, the ABC affiliate in San Antonio, KSAT. And the gentleman asked me just one question. He says, Mike, um, are you okay with multitasking? He says, yeah, I've done a lot of it, sir, the past four years. Okay. Could you be here every day? Well, my, my wife stays home with my son. I, I, we're cutting the coupons and all that. That's really good. When can you start? So that's how I got the job. It was basically the fill-in because there were so many single moms there. You know, and there's days when the kid's sick, you can't be there. So they taught me how to do the camera and everything. So I got to really multitask at a TV station. It was funny. We went out on location one time. I was the boom guy at a siege. You know, some SWAT thing was going on. That was kind of brought back memories. So I did that for a while. Uh, my dad got emphysema, and I had to go back to Chicago, and I picked up a job with our rep firm because TV stations connect with an agent to get them advertising business from the agency to the TV station. And we were the middlemen. So back then that was big and I took a job there and I went back to Chicago. Um, so I was in a reserve unit for about two years in San Antonio when I was at the TV station. The only time I could have got hauled back in was when um, the Russians shot down that Korean airliner uh, over uh, the <laughs> KLW07 it was called. And there was an American congressman from Georgia who was on that plane. And uh, we thought, uh-oh, Reagan's in power, yikes. I got called, and I, it was my weekend for my duty, because you do one weekend a month. They sent me over to a site called Medina, which was an Air Force base. And I went downstairs, and they just gave me tapes to get my language back up. Listen to Russian, very intense. Did that for the Saturday, did that for the Sunday, and then got to go back. We didn't get called back in. But uh, that was the only time I could have been activated back into regular Army. Uh, went home to Chicago. I, I, I stayed in advertising for 22 years. Uh, it went bye-bye in 05. I got picked up by a little company out in uh, Norcross, Georgia. They were run by Indians uh, in, from India. Nicest people in the world. A little disorganized, but I got them organized. And we set up a sales pattern within the company to call out. And they had me talking because when you hear the accent, it's very difficult. Some Indians they have these accents. It's hard to see what you're saying. So I got to do that. Uh, that went till 08, and then the crash came. Uh, the 08 crash got let go, and I worked in a lot of schools for uh, for profit schools uh, around like perimeter, uh, Georgia perimeter. I went to and a few others, and just calling out to people to see we have questions about education. Uh, so the gift of gab I picked up again as a kid, you know, working and getting clients. Hey, go on my tour this Sunday. It's only a dollar, you know. And uh, I remember the 
the first Russian I learned was uh, Daichi Mibel, I think was, uh, keep the change. And um, <laughs> so I tell people I became an unrepentant Eisenhower Republican like Charles Schultz <laughs> at 10 years old. And, um, but it was, uh, looking back at it, this was the best four years of my life. I had a ball. I did not get shot at to the GIs who did. I'm sorry, but you, you had it way worse than I. I wish you could have had it as good as I had it. Because, no, the, the closest I ever came to any kind of encounter, we were on an East tour, and we were walking near a Soviet garrison, and Dummy Me had the camera out, and Dummy Me lifted it up. Dummy Me took a shot of a picture of Brezhnev inside there. And then suddenly, here comes the... The Russian jeep, the major jumps out. Dieti fotoapparat, tipia, dieti fotoapparat. Okay, time to be Donald Trump again. Let's negotiate this. You're not getting my camera. So we kind of, okay, dieti film. Oh, film's good. Now, he had two young NCLs next to him. And in any army, the NCLs always love the opportunity of their officer being shown up. And I was an NCL, and they knew that. This young Ukrainian kid smiled at me, kind of like that kid in the movie about the hockey game. He's, you know, good, the medicans. And I said, so, uh, mejor, dieti film. I gave him the camera. Ooh, he didn't, never seen a Vivitar camera. You know, he was looking at it, shaking it like that, pushing the buttons. Ha, that's what they do. Yeah. I took it out for him. Here you go. So he's going, ah, like that. He walks away. And I said, mejor, where's your salute? Because back there, we were still allies. In Berlin, they saluted our officers, and our enlisted saluted their officers, and the British and the French and everything. <coughs> and he just went like, Rah, like that. So he took off. Uh, but again, it was the best life experience in the world for me. Okay. I think. On camera. Yeah, my son brought up a fact about, uh, I, I was seeing a little RAF lady, uh, and we were going out to dinner and everything, and her mom was a uh, German war bride. Now, here's a little story she told me. Um, she lost a lot of her family during the war, her aunts and stuff, because they were in Coventry, England. If you know anything about this, the history of Ultra, uh, uh, Enigma picked up that the Germans were going to bomb Coventry. They could not alert the people. If they did, the Germans would know they broke the code. She lost two aunts in that bombing. Oh, yeah. So I, I would go out with her. It was a little date and, you know, a little kissy at the gate. No, that's all. Gave her a little kiss at the gate and went home. Now, they told us you cannot fraternize um, with foreign nationals. Well, okay, fine. I'm not going to go out with these German girls. I don't speak the language. I, I wouldn't do it anyway. So I'm asleep in the, in the CQ, charge of quarters. That's the guy that's uh, on duty. Said, Rouse, get up. The CO's here. He wants to see you. This is in the middle of the night. So I thought, oh, my God, my father passed away or something. No. So I go down there in my bathroom. He's in his robe and slippers. I'm in my robe and slippers. <laughs> so, sir, Mike, you have to salute. Okay. Um, the British commander called me and said, you've been kind of dating one of the, uh, their RIF uh, ops. Yeah. Okay, Mike. Um, you do know that you cannot have a continuous relationship with foreign nationals. No, I'm not, sir. Uh, she's an ally. Okay, Mike. Um, now my CO was from Chicago. Great guy. All right, Mike, let's forget that I'm a captain and you're a sergeant. Okay, we're just two schleps into Chicago back on the block. <clears throat> when I say foreign national, what comes in your head? The Germans. No, okay. It, Wendy, that's her name? Yes. Okay. Is she from England? Yeah. Is England a foreign country? Yes, it is. All right, Mike, now let's do some inductive reason here. I went to college and you went to college. Uh, she is a what? A foreign national. You mean I can't? That's right, Mikey. You cannot you cut it off, break it off, because here's what's going to happen. If you don't cut it off, <coughs> you're going to be making my omelet in the morning in the mess hall. Now, your dad was a cook, right? Uh, yes, sir, he was. Uh, now, you like cooking, don't you? Yes, sir. Would you like to cook for a battalion? Oh, God, no, sir. That's a bad job, Ada. Oh, yes, sir. It's a very bad job. Okay. Now, if I don't like my omelet, I can really let you know. If you don't believe me, ask my wife. I could be a bear in the morning. Yes, sir. I understand. Cut it off now. Yes, sir. So I went and cut it off. And he told me at that time, you know, why don't you take some leave? Uh, nothing happened in Afghanistan. Why don't you go to Vienna? And uh, three or four days later, I took my trip, went to Vienna. Met, yes. I come back to Berlin, and apparently, my, when I told my CEO that I met the girl of my dreams, he said, Mike, congratulations. Uh, please tell me she's a, uh, an American citizen. Well, she's from Texas. Close enough. And so he went on to get me the housing and all that, the paperwork and all that. So are you going to have you? No, sir, I'll do it when I get to the hill. So I went to the site, and she was there at lunch. I didn't know this, but they told her that I met somebody. So she's going to string me. 
Hey, Wendy, how you doing? Oh, how was Vienna? Oh, I had a good time. A little bird tells me something very intriguing happened. Oh, God, you know, says Michael, we're British intelligence. We know everything. And she said, is she pretty? Yeah, she's like Elizabeth Taylor pretty. Oh, really? I see. No, Elizabeth Taylor's English. You Yanks don't know that, do you? No. Uh, is she uh, an American, obviously? Yeah, yes. Okay. Uh, from where? Texas. Ooh, cowgirl. Did she lasso you? And I'm thinking for the first time in my I see, I was always the dumpy and never the dumper. You know, you know I, girls, eh, I don't go out with you no more. I never cut it off. And I'm getting ready for the beef stew to go right here. <laughs> okay. So she's stringing me on and everything. And I, she started laughing. She says, Michael, my commander told me. I know all about it. Uh, he told me, you know, Michael's a delightful lad, but he is a Yank and from Chicago, you know, bang, bang. All they want to do is get into your knickers. Yeah, and that's what the Brits, the old thing from World War II, overpaid, oversexed over here. And that's, that still was going. Oh, another little story I'll tell you, too. That came into my mind. So I had to cut it off, and it was there. Now, uh, going back, there was, um, on that British duty train, there was a, uh, you can buy a, a bottle of wine. You can, you can drink on the train. And we were in our compartment. And uh, a few of the gals were a little bit sloshed, I guess that's the term they used. We stopped at uh, Potsdam or somewhere, and the Russians were guarding outside. And this one girl looked at the other and said, you know, that Ivan out there looks rather lonely. I said, what are you going to do, invite him in for tea and crumpets? She goes, no, I'm going to let him have some tots. And this girl just un 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 opened it up right there, splattered it right into the glass, and that Russian soldier uh, ran off. Now... The prudishness thing. You'd think, oh, wow, hey, free shell. No, he, he got scared and ran. It, it, somebody got wind of it on the train. The train was kept there, and this officer came down. If you ever expose yourself again to Soviet personnel, I shall personally see to it you never ride Her Majesty's duty train again. Do we understand each other? Yes, on the major. <laughs> so, so that was a story I forgot to put down on the thing. There. That happened. <laughs> okay, cut. <laughs> On camera. Okay. All right. In closing, uh, I'm kind of glad I did what I did. Um, I know a lot of people who to this day are on watch, listening, making sure that we can wake up and not have to go <laughs> like that when we turn the news on. And uh, to all those who serve currently, who knows who will serve, I thank you for um, giving us a life and uh, giving a life for my son and my wife as well. And for the spirit of those who served as well, uh, they will thank you forever. So thanks for this opportunity. Well, thank you so much. Thank you for your service thank and thank you. you for taking the time. You have a sure. fascinating story. We have very few <laughs> intelligence um, folks uh, yes. on, in the collection and this is really fun hey. because you served at a unique time. That very was a unique. very unique time. And a unique mission too as well. Yes. To having a big yeah. mountain up there. That's and excellent. that mountain I forgot to mention was the rubble from the Battle of Berlin. They put it up there. Wow. And the, the Trümmerfrauen were the women that loaded up the trucks. They paid them to take everything wow. out of the city and dump it there. Have you been back to Berlin? Uh, it's on my bucket list. It's okay. on my bucket list, yeah. Okay. And my sister-in-law is doing quite well, and we might just go back someday and see it if there's a price is right. Yeah. But I'd love to see it when the wall is gone. You know? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. definitely. That would be great. Awesome. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks. This is great.